pulled. Uh, so I think it's recording also. I will just share my screen. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep. All right. Cool. Uh, so we can start with the session then. So this, what I intend from this session is for you guys to understand how India performs on different indexes, right? So this topic is important on two aspects. One, because India will always be a very prevalent discussion in all your GDPIs, in your VATs, and even in your interviews, right? That is something that they'll always discuss. And secondly, these professors who take your interview, they're very interested in ideas like statistics, world economics, global geopolitics, right? All these things. So that is where different indexes, right? World indices that comes into place because these world indices are a, are a matrix of all these statistics and also all of these uh, different world economics. All right. So that would be today's session. Before that, I would just like to give you a small introduction about myself. So my name is Yash Rati. I have done my um, MBA from IIM Lucknow and I'm currently working as an associate consultant at Bain & Company. Right. Uh, so I've been uh, connected with PrepZone for the last three years and I've been mentoring students there. And me, myself, I was also a mentee at one point. Right. So, of course, I can vouch for the um, things that PrepZone has done for me. And we mentors try to do the same for the new mentees that come in. Right. So we'll discuss in detail about PrepZone and its offerings at the end. But right now, I would want everyone to focus on the session and gain as much as you as you can from this. All right. Also, I'll be open to questions. So just put them in the chat box whenever you have. So the flow of the session is that we will be picking up one one world index at a time, discussing it in depth. And then if you have any questions, then I'll pick them up. Right. So I'll pause after every index. All right. Till now, does anyone have any questions? OK, seeing none. Right. Um, I'll just keep my message box open. All right. Then we'll start with the session. So the first index that I would like to pick is the Human Development Index, right? That is HDI, which a lot of people would have heard about, right? This is one of the better known indexes. And it is also very prevalent because marking the human development of any country, ranking the human development of any country is the pri prime important thing for any country, right? to understand how well their humans or how well their citizens are faring. So that is the importance of HDI. Let's now go into details of HDI and look at some very important points, right? So the idea of this index is not to remember everything that how HDI is calculated or what is every country's ranking, right? That is not something that we're looking for, but just picking up interesting facts from every index. That is what will help you during your GDP and VAT. At the end, we'll also discuss that how can you use these pointers in your favor, right? So first, what is HDI? It is a composite index of three things, right? So an index which is created after ranking countries on three aspects and then combining those rankings. So those rankings are A, life expectancy. Second, education. That is years of schooling. And third would be the per capita income indicators. So a country scores high in HDI when the citizen's lifespan is higher. Second, when their education level is higher, that is years of schooling. And third, when the GNI per capita is high. Right. So those are the three aspects that one should look out for. So that covers a broad gamut of different parameters, which can help us identify if the citizens of that country are faring well or not. All right. Now, a few pointers on its initiation. First, a very interesting point. The index was developed by Mehboob al Haq. That was a Pakistani economist. Right. So a lot of times the questions might arise that, all right, uh, during your GDP, that we know what India has given to the world. Is there anything that Pakistan has given to the world? Right. Sometimes these types of questions are very prevalent because they want to understand how much do you know about other countries, and especially our neighbors, right? Pakistan, China. Nepal, all these countries. So this is a very interesting point that you can always bring forth that the HDI or the Human Development Index that was given by a Pakistani economist. All right, so that is the first thing. 
Second, this report is released by UNDP. Right. So this point again becomes important because just make a note that you should go back and read more about UN as well. Because United Nations also is the prime apex body of all these geopolitical ideas, right? All the geopolitical tensions that happen. So you should know that what United Nations is, what are the different bodies that United Nations has, right? So there is something like UNGA, that is the United Nations General Assembly. Then there is UNSC, that is the United Nations Security Council, right? So different bodies like this exist in UN. So again, this particular index is released by UNDP, but you should go back and read more about UN, its different bodies, and what are the roles of these bodies, all right? <clears throat> After this, we have India's ranking now. So again, rankings are not out for 2023. So make a note that whenever they are out, look out for them and update your rankings. But for 2022, India's ranking was 132 out of 191 countries. Right, and it fell from 2021. So earlier we were 131, now we are 132. Right, so that again is a minor change. But again, that is where India stands vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Right, so not a very good position, not the you know top 50, top 100 positions. So that just shows the level of human development that India has undertaken till now. Now here, the top ranking countries, they would be Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, Hong Kong and Australia. Right here, you can notice that a lot of Scandinavian or a lot of European countries would exist. Like Switzerland, Norway, Iceland. And that is because the type of services or the type of things provided to the humans or citizens by the government is way better than what other countries provide, right? So they're able to provide better hospitalization that increases life expectancy. They're able to provide better education, cheaper and free education that improves the years of schooling, right? And thirdly, of course, they're able to provide them with income generation opportunities, better job outcomes. So that improves the GNI of the country. So always, whenever you get some points, always try to backtrack it. That why Switzerland, Norway, Iceland on the top. Understand what HDI is created out of. And that will give you a very clear picture <clears throat> that at least these three things are doing well for the countries, right? At least their hospitalization, right? The amount of hospitals that they have and the types of services that they have, or even the health insurance that they might provide. Along with that, the schooling level and the GNI would be good for these countries. So backtracking these ideas always helps you out. So that is more or less about the numbers on HDI. Now we have two important things that you should notice because HDI is always a very controversial index. <clears throat> there are some advantages and some disadvantages of HDI. First, let's un understand the advantages, right? The first thing is HDI uses two types of social data, right? That is the health, life expectancy. And second is the education and it uses one type of economic data as well that is gni which means that the measure of uses a broad range of information and is not tied to any one measure it's not that it is only calculating say health of the people or only calculating may maybe their education it's giving us a lot of flavors <clears throat> so it's a very good diversified index right so there is much more accurate measure this is a much more accurate measure Second is that the information is updated annually. That is a very important thing. Every year a new list will come out, right? And collected by a range of people who ensure that the data is accurate. So those are the good things going on for HDI. Now moving on the disadvantages, right? That is the controversial bit. The first thing is that there is clearly a lack of newer age metrics, right? Now, how do the disadvantages help for you? If you are starting discussing, discussing HDI in your GDPI panel, right? Maybe in your personal interview, you're discussing that. <clears throat> and they ask you a question. Not exactly maybe that what are the disadvantages, but they ask you, how can you improve HDI? If you're a consultant to the UNDP, <clears throat> what would you suggest to improve HDI? Right, these things come on very clearly because they might ask you that what career path you want to choose. And you might say if it's social consulting. So they can say that, okay, you are a consultant to UNDP. How would you improve their HDI? Right. So therein you can first give a description of HDI and then you can tell, say that there's a lack of consideration for these newer age metrics and we should include them also, such as technological development, contribution towards global initiatives, civil advancements, right? All these things are a very important factor to know how better the citizens are faring, right? A lot of countries 
who have great technological development whose citizens are having a you know very good time in their countries of course so that is not being considered because of the lack of concentration for such metrics that is the first thing second too much concentration is put on gni so the wealth creation causes wealthy nations to artificially hijack their rankings even if the citizens are not faring very well right even like countries like usa where in the citizens might be no, on the brink of poverty also a lot of them but since the country is wealthy that is why they can artificially hijack the ranking so those are the two disadvantages of using hdi so the second point you can say is that putting in a better economic metric than gni okay. now just opening up the parameters that we used right so first if we look at the dimension index column these are the three indexes that we used <clears throat> the life expectancy education and gni going back these are the indicators for them life expectancy at birth that is what we are calculating secondly expected years of schooling or mean years of schooling and third would be our gni per capita that is ppp also right it is it has been cleared out by ppp that means that purchasing power parity has been applied there now the dimensions it will calculate again is a long and healthy life increased knowledge and a decent standard of living that is what any citizen would require below are the basic formulas of gni and ppb right so gni just means gdp of a country that is the the gross production that the country has plus money flowing from foreign countries minus money flowing out to foreign countries right that is the import export bit of the whole production and lastly it has been cleared out by ppb also so that has been ppb adjusted so that is the overall idea about hdi how it works what are the good things going on for hdi right what can be improved and what is india standing on it right that is the whole idea about it again the interesting bit was that developed by a pakistan economist <clears throat> so again a very interesting point to always discuss all right so that was the first metric again let's do ease of doing business also and then we'll take up any questions all right so now here is ease of doing business again this is the metric that a lot of you would have heard about because uh kafi zyada news mein aata hai right and the indian government also promotes this idea because india's ranking is quite decent in ease of doing business right and of course india has done good things to get this ranking because it has eased out laws towards opening up new businesses again giving out grants secs right special economic zone so that tax rebate would be given to such com com companies who want to open up so india definitely has done a lot of good things here that is why they have good rankings right but again ease of doing business is not a currently functioning metric that index has been discontinued for now but still it is always in discussion because of india's good rankings so that is why one should know about it at least so ease of doing business just means how easily can a business be opened and function in a particular country measured on 10 indices to get a singular metric right so more varied index wherein 10 indices are measured we learn about 10 indices later on right in the next slide now it has been developed by few economists at the world bank so that is all you need to know you don't need to know the names india's ranking in 2020 that was 63rd out of 191 countries right that is the top one third countries at least around that only right so that is a significantly good ranking considering 2014 my ranking was 142 right so from 2014 the current uh, bjp government they have made strides at least in the ease of doing business so again if the question rises that maybe uh, we've been seeing a lot of you know negative things about uh, religion that bjp might have been doing do you think they have done anything good this is a point that you can always bring forth that the ease of doing business ranking that has significantly improved in, with the government said next top ranking countries here are new zealand singapore hong kong and denmark right singapore and hong kong are prime of ac the biggest you know uh, industry hubs also so that is the idea now why was this ranking discontinued right that is a very interesting bit again the controversial bit that can always be a point of discussion right so if someone asks you that are these indexes generally what we see in world indexes are they reliable always then if you want to say the answer is no then ease of doing business can be the example that you use that this is the reason why we shouldn't trust indexes as much as we do right now what happened with ease of doing business first in 2018 there was a manipulation scandal that came out 
right so in 2018 paul romer the world bank's chief economist announced that past releases of the index right the past lists that were created would be corrected and recalculated going back at least four years and the index had repeatedly man manipulated its methodology unfairly penalizing the country's rankings during the administration of left-wing president michelle bachelet right so the index itself has manipulated its met methodology and also unfairly penalized countries which an index can do right to reduce their ranking so that was a scandal that came out and they said that we'll recalculate the rankings now for the past four years so that they can be improved now in 2020 there was some data irregularity right so several major newspapers like financial times economist they reported that the data of countries like china azerbaijan uae saudi right among others were suspected to be inappropriately altered. So a lot of these Middle Eastern countries and other superpowers such as China, they were not given such better rankings, right? Their rankings were altered in 2020 doing business publication. Thus the World Bank announced on 27th August 2020 that it would pause the doing business publication. So doing business publication is the parent of this ease of doing business index. And in 2021, the World Bank announced that it would be discontinuing the doing business report following the release of an independent report detailing the specifics of this 2020 and 2018 irregularities. Right. On how senior leaders at the bank manipulated the data and pressured experts to change rankings and methodology to improve scores for certain countries. So that is why this whole metric was discontinued. So we have to understand that the indexes are again created by humans, right, who can be swayed as well. So that is what we have to keep into consideration because some, the one who is creating this index, they hold the power to decide the methodology, which can always be manipulated. That is an example of how an index can go wrong, right? And that is why I've added this index point as well, so that you can understand that how we can't just blindly trust these indexes. Now, here are the 10 parameters that were used, right? Again, don't need to remember these parameters, just get an idea of how a business is you know what things could benefit a business if someone asks you that maybe if you're the government or if you're the consultant to the government and they're asking you that they want to improve their ease of doing business or they want to improve their industry interaction they want to in increase their gdp what should they do you can give a few pointers out of this right you can say these things will help us increase number of businesses so why not do this first would be starting a business right we should improve on the procedures the time, cost, and minimal capital to open a business. We can improve on that. Second, we can ease out the construction permits. Third, we can give cheaper electricity at the beginning, right? Give special rebates to them. Fourth, we can ease out the process of registering property. Fifth, a very important point, ease out giving credit, right? Cheaper credit. So strength of legal rights index, credit information index. Next, protecting the investors. Next, paying taxes, trading across borders, enforcing contracts, and resolving insolvency. Right. So ease of doing just business just doesn't mean starting up a business and running it, but also when a business is in distress and when it needs to close that down, then you should have a very strong procedure in place for insolvency. So that is the idea with ease of doing business. Right. So now before we move on to the third index, that is World Competitive Index, we will take up any questions that there are. Uh, of course, yeah. Pakistan gave two things, Coke Studio as well. Hope you guys are getting, uh, you know, the flavors that I'm trying to put put into this these two indexes. So again, I just don't want you guys to understand what indexes are, how they work, but also that what are the specific things that you can answer to your panel during a GD, PI, or even write in the mat. Right? Picking up examples out of these things is more important than just knowing all the information. You will get access to the PBD. Yeah, this PBD would be sent. Not a problem. Okay. Seeing no questions, let's move on. Um, yeah. So this is the third index now. That is the World Competitive Index. Right. So here in the IMD, that is the Institute of Management Development. Right. Competitiveness Yearbook. It comes out every year. First published in 1989, 
is a comprehensive annual report and worldwide reference point on competitiveness of countries. Right. Now, this index is not very famous. World Competitive Index, and generally it doesn't even come in the news. famous But it analyzes and ranks countries according to how they manage their competencies to achieve long-term value creation. Right. So the idea is that sometimes in your GDPI, you might be asked a question. Here, there are multiple indexes to measure the countries. But how do we know which country is better than the other? What is a you know single metric that we can use? He competitively con better. Hai. Then world competitive index is something that you can tell them, right? Because it is a very you know overlapping index which considers the economy, government, you know, the industry or the jobs and the infrastructure of the country, right? So very wholesome metric. So this can give you a very good purview of the industry facets and the government facets. Along with this, if you attach the HDI, it will give you the social facets, right? So a perfect combination to understand the world rankings. Now here, the report is released by Institute of Management Development. India's ranking is 40th out of 63. So not a lot of countries participate, but the major ones do. And top ranking countries are Denmark, Ireland, Switzerland, Singapore, Netherlands. Again, a lot of Scandinavian countries and your Singapore, right? These always appear in these lists. So it examines four components to assess a country's prosperity and competitiveness. First is the performance of economy. Now there are multiple metrics that it takes into consideration, right? As I've mentioned about 334 competitiveness criteria. So don't need to go into the details because once you start going into details of everything, then it will, that is the point where you break, right? So when you think that performance of the economy is a good enough thing to answer, just stay on that, right? Of course, read the details, but don't try to memorize them always. Secondly, efficiency in the government. So economy, ho gaya, government efficiency, ho gaya. third efficiency in the workplace, that how well are the workers able to work, right? And lastly, the infrastructure level. So these four metrics, they are the part of the world competitive index. Now, the India's ranking fell in the last year, from the last year. The reasons were A, the country fared slightly poorer than the other countries in business efficiency, infrastructure and economic performance. Right. So you can always tell you these three measures were problem. Now, if your panel asks you that if you have to mention the top three problems, right, in India that you feel, yeah, if there's any proof that these are the problems in India, what would you say? Now, the three measures that helped India in its score, right, reaching the score was exchange rate st stability, the compensation levels and improvements in pollution control. Right. This has helped them retain the ranking. So what helped, what made them fall was the business efficiency, infra and economic performance. And what helped them retain was exchange rate stability, compensation level and improvements in pollution control. So this is the world competitive index. Again, not a very famous one. Most of the questions won't come out of this. They will never ask you directly what is world competitive index. But again, picking up examples. If someone asks you what is the you know comprehensive index for us to measure, on the industry aspect or the on the government aspect, then WCI or the World Competitive Index can always be your answer. That is the idea, right? Next, we have the Global Gender Gap Index. So gender is always a part of discussion whenever it comes to these schools, right? We have seen that uh, specific genders also get uh, preference or more marks for admission, right? And there's a reason for it because of the disparity and the gender gap that we see not only in country, not only in governments, but also in education institutes, right? So if they ask you that, do you think this is a fair idea, right? To give more marks to maybe female candidates, do you think it's a good thing? So if your answer is yes, then you can quote the global gender gap index. You can tell that this is the issue. This is the global gender gap that we're facing. And that is why such marks or such additional help should be given to create less disparity between genders. So here, the gender gap is the difference between women and men as reflected in social, political, intellectual, cultural, or economic attainments or attitudes. So to serve as a compass to track progress on relative gaps between women and men on health, education, economy, and politics. <clears throat> right? So we have covered a lot of facets that would be your health, education, economy, and politics. This report is released by World Economic Forum, that is WEF. India's ranking on the whole list is 127 out of 146. 
in 2021, it was way worse. It was 140th. So we were on the brink of being at the last, which we would be in a ranking that I'll show you later. Right. But here also, it's very bad. Top ranking countries, again, your Scandinavian countries and countries like New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, they always rank high in all these indexes. Right. So Iceland, Finland, Norway, here also are the top countries. Now, how does it calculate the global gender gap? Let's see. Just give me a minute. First would be political empowerment, right? So percentage of women in parliament and in ministerial positions. So these are the rankings, right? The numbers that I've mentioned after that, these are the rankings for uh, India, right? Again, you can see India ka ranking is 48th in political empowerment, right? So the reason for this is that you know that india has a reservation of 33 percent of seats in panchayati raj institute for women and also in upper level government work right so if a question is asked you that do you think india has done anything very significant to you know decrease this gender gap so this is the first point that should always come out right because that is the better ranking or the highest ranking that we have done that is the first thing second would be your economic participation and opportunity Right, percentage of women in labor, wage equality, earned income, all these things. Again, India ranks poorly here. Educational attainment, that is literacy rate, still decent ranking, that is 107. And lastly, health and survival, sex ratio at birth and life expectancy, that is the worst of the worst. We are at the lowest rank. And we, of course, have a lot of proofs for that as well. So that is the current global gender index that we have, or our gender gap at least. And of course, a few pointers on how we can improve that should be the homework that you do right make notes on how we can improve the gender gap because essay questions can always come out what india has done for it those are the next two points first would be a lot of you know initiatives that they've created beti bachao beti padao sukanya samriti yojana the mahila police female entrepreneurship the push that they've been given right all these things the government is doing to reduce the gender gap and also the political reservation that we know of right so you should also try to make some points if they ask you that you are a consultant to the world, to India itself, how would you reduce this gender gap? So you should know the answer to that. All right. Cool. Before going on to the fifth index, we'll take any questions that there are. Um, actions taken by NDA for ease of doing IBC, MSME certification, GST. Right. A lot of good actions, right? So IBC again is one of the more important, you know, aspects that the government has done for insolvency as well. So that is the idea. So everyone should go back and read about the insolvency and bankruptcy code, right? IBC. Aditya Dev, while I relate efficiency of companies and workplace as ROCE, ROA, how do you measure the efficiency of a government? Yeah, so there are a lot of metrics. If I open up the 334 list to measure the efficiency of government, again, I don't have that handy. Should always go back and read about it. But government efficiency is also measured on the type of laws that they're coming out with, right? Uh, the type of inclusion for the governments, like how the government is selected, because in a lot of countries, the election process is itself very faulty, right? Countries like China, countries like Korea, North Korea, right? So the efficiency of government decreases because of the election procedure itself. So then comes the working, and then comes the powers that these government agencies or the government officials have, right? So these are a few metrics wherein they are able to track the efficiency of a government. Again, rankings are given on the basis of a lot of metrics inside them as well. Since there are only 63 countries in WCI, its utilization is very low. The idea is again that you have to pay for a lot of these metrics, right? The countries also have to contribute for these metrics. So not everyone is interested in getting involved in these metrics. So that is why 63, but utilization is very low because only the top countries would like to in understand their competitive index, right? So that is the idea. But if you're looking at an overall level, then if you are in that list, that means you are willing to understand your competitiveness. That is the only idea. Government efficiency can be evaluated using metrics like in literacy rates, crime rates, tax collections. Right. So literacy rates, not, not specifically that. Uh, inflation management may be uh, a difficult term to calculate. But yeah, crime rates, tax collection, budget deficits, all good points, right? The functioning of the government. So uskin the coffee core points are there. How are they managing the police? How are they managing the economy? How are they managing healthcare? All these things, right? Healthcare outcomes are a different metric. 
but what they are doing to improve that is their matter as a bcom student should i should we remember all these numbers no no you shouldn't the only for example if someone's ranking is 132nd you only need to remember ki it's in the 130s right even remembering that is more than enough and yahan pe sirf panch hi uh, indexes hai that you are seeing right so just remembering their ballpark numbers is also enough kuch rankings tumhe waisi yaad ho jayegi right some rankings just get imprinted in your brains to wo ho jayega that's the best whatever you can't remember exactly just remember the ballpark at least so that you know where india stands you don't see ki india ekdam worse hai where in india is still decent in that index since the global gap index is given by world economic forum is the gap majorly focused on the economic gap where european countries again gain an advantage no uh, i think global gap index the gender gap index is one of the better metrics that i have seen right because it does not only look at the economic gap but also the gender gap in education politics right your healthcare again healthcare becomes a very important metric to notice that what is the uh, life expectancy outcomes of females right so that is why global gender index is still a better metric all right any other questions on these metrics also if the session becomes a little more statistics heavy then let me know i don't want it to be a number session right remembering numbers is not important i'll try to you know be a little more layman in the language that i'm using but uh, the important thing is that how are you able to use these arguments in your gdp and vat ki agar mujhse kisi ne pucha ki um, is hdi a good metric usko improve kaise kar sakte hai then i can tell them ki new or age alternative chalo uske andar to improve that metric right if someone asks me that is some has pakistan given anything i can tell them hdi and of course coke studio if someone asks me that how can i measure the competitiveness of my country <clears throat> wci is a good metric if someone asks you ki agar global gender gap hame measure karna hai right ya gender gap in a country measure karna hai to kin kin cheezon mein we'll measure that so before this session maybe your answer would have been that how many women are you know getting jobs versus what men are getting jobs kya the gap in their wages that would have been the answer that you gave right but now you can tell them that there are four five metrics the gap in education the gap in politics the gap in livelihood wages the gap in healthcare right so bus evolving your idea about the type of answers that you can give will make or break your conversion right they just want to see kitna refined ho and how many new ideas that you can give that is the only thing all right so let's continue with the metrics again we have two interesting ones at least these two are the ones that i always focus on the fifth one is the henley passport index right so this henley passport index has come into the limelight a lot in the past few years because of the you know importance towards traveling the interest that people have gained towards traveling that is why this index is also very well known so now what is this index the henley passport index is the original ranking of all the world's passports according to the number of destinations their holders can access without a prior visa right so if your passport can help you enter a country without a prior visa right that could include zero visa or a visa on arrival all these things can be included it's not that you don't require a visa but even if you're getting a visa on arrival that's also something that is a benefit to you right you don't have to do any prior paperwork so if your country's passport can do that then you get one point in this henley passport index it was launched in 2006 and includes 199 different passports so a very comprehensive index with all the countries generally right again it was created by dr christian that was the chair who is the chairman of henley and partners so henley and partners is the company that gives out this index india's ranking is 80th out of around 200 countries which is a significantly decent rank right it has been improved from 87 2022 so again when we say 80 that would mean india has access to around 80 countries right wherein they can again around not exactly 80 countries but around that number wherein they can get maybe a visa or visa on arrival right now the top ranking countries here would be singapore who has access to 193 countries so most of the countries singapore can enter on a visa right without a visa or on a visa on arrival they don't need to do any prior paperwork then next would be japan right which has 192 countries ka access then we have france germany italy south korea spain and sweden with 191 countries access 
right so if anyone asks you what is the most powerful passport it's not the us passport or the australian passport or the canadian passport you need to know this that singapore japan right and a few scandinavian countries you can just say finland uh you know sweden all these countries or maybe a few european countries like france germany italy these are the stronger passports because they have access to the countries without a visa or a visa on arrival so for each travel destination now this is how we measure this ranking if no visa is required for a passport holder for a country or territory then they get a score of one one point they get right a score of value one is also applied if the passport holder can obtain a visa on arrival visa on arrival just means that you don't have to do any prior paperwork you go there and on the spot on the airport itself while doing the immigration you will receive your visa right you can just fill a form and get the visa or if you can get an eta that is an electronic travel authority wherein online only you can fill a form and you can get the visa you don't have to do an interview so that is also uh, you know a very prevalent way of getting a visa when entering the destination so now as of 2023 a singapore passport offers its holders visa free or visa on arrival access to 193 countries japan gives that for 192 countries the british passport will give you that for 190 countries and the new zealand and australian passports also give that for 190 countries so those are a few numbers on henley passport index don't need to remember ki kitne countries ka access milta hai. just remembering the maximum one ki singapore gets it for around 190 to 193 countries that is enough right but again if they ask you that what is the henley password index now you know what to answer right that gives points on how many countries does a passport hold the power to enter without a prior interview faced visa all right so that is the henley passport index again india's ranking is quite decent that is at 80th rank in out of 199 countries right so moving on the sixth we have the global hunger index right now just a question before i move on why do you think the global hunger index is the most interesting one in this particular session anything in the comments any ideas why ghi that is the global hunger index would be the most important one but i think there is not a lot of idea about it okay it's fine let's just look into it then so the idea is that india's ranking right generally in the global hunger index that is one of the worst rankings that we have right so india's ranking is 111th out of 125th country that is the bottom 10 15 countries so whenever someone asks you that you know which is the one of the worst indian rankings that we have seen that would be the global hunger index and that has continued right that has prevailed you have tried to improve it but it generally comes at a very low level right and generally we are below countries like pakistan and sri lanka also in these rankings so that is a very shocking factor because in most of the rankings we are at least above these countries right so if the question arises that is there any place wherein we are you know worse than countries like pakistan and sri lanka who are still very underdeveloped then the answer is the global hunger index so ghi is a tool for comprehensively measuring and tracking hunger at a global regional and national level the report is published by the concern while worldwide and felt hunger life india's ranking is 111th out of 125 countries top ranking countries are belarus bosnia chile china croatia right a lot of smaller countries you will see here because easier for them to you know manage their hunger worst ranking countries are lesotho democratic republic of congo madagascar african republic and yemen a lot of these african countries they perform the worst in these rankings right because of the hunger issues that they have or the malnutrition issues that they have again this is measured on four parameters right first undernourishment that is the share of population whose caloric intake is insufficient so that is a pretty high chunk that they are giving one third of the score is decided on, decided on this itself right so caloric intake sufficient nahi hai. so that is the only metric wherein the whole population is taking into picture the next three metrics is specifically for children that is child stunning under the age of age five who have low height for their age next child wasting under the age of five who have low weight for their height 
and lastly child mortality children who die before their fifth birthday right so that is how we measure the ghi now the biggest problem in ghi that i saw like these are the pointers that i also wanted to mention was first that ghi uses an erroneous measure of hunger right that is three out of the four variables are related to children so that can't represent the entire population very accurately of course the initial years and the nutrition that children get in those years is very important and that defines the hunger levels as well but if you're not taking into consideration the larger picture right the larger population and giving them equal representation then it's very difficult to justify this ranking right again i'm not disregarding the ranking it still holds a lot of merit india uh, the number that india has definitely shows the level of hunger it has but still there can be better measuring also and the second idea is that the fourth indicator ghi of the ghi that is the proportion of undernourished population right the only metric that we have that is the non child metric right of course the first one in this list that is undernourishment the share of population whose caloric intake is not sufficient that is just based on an opinion poll conducted on a very small sample size of 3000 people right so again that also becomes problematic because for a country like india which represents one fifth of the world's population 3000 is a very very small number even to call a sample size so those are the few points for which ghi can improve on but again overall it gives us a good picture of how we are performing on hunger index and if we can improve or not right so these are the few important indices important metrics that i wanted to discuss today again the idea was not to focus on the numbers a lot but to understand that how these indexes are created why they are created and what are the topic or what are the talking points that you can pick up from these indexes right now i have a few more indexes that again i won't be discussing right now but you should make a note of them and go back and study about them so one would be the world happiness report again a very interesting index that has been coming out you know very recently if anyone knows what is the top ranking country in the world happiness report do put it in the messages let's see if anyone knows that right and next another one would be world press freedom index right so the world press freedom index that is also a very important metric that should be studied right so those are the two other metrics that i would want you guys to understand all right now before we end the session i will again want to explain to you how do you use these pointers right what are the areas wherein you can use these pointers so if there are any questions first we'll take them then i'll explain that how can you use these pointers very well right so finland is the top ranking country in the world happiness report is there any starting point as such or should i go through these? so there's no starting point in learning right you should start with these indices and once you start searching about them, right, it just creates a rabbit hole. So HDI start karoge, then you will learn more about the other metrics that it is calculating. Then you would want to learn about that. So just devote maybe half a day towards indexes and research as much as you can, right? That is how I at least used to do during my prep days, wherein I used to devote, you know, four or five hours, I used to keep a blog and used to think that <clears throat> in three, four hours, mein, I'll try to learn as much about this topic and create as many notes and those notes used to help me at the end of the day because i now have a very good composite of all the knowledge and of course there's unlimited knowledge it's not that in three four hours you can cover everything but at least the things that the interviewer would know that you can cover right because they can't also have all the knowledge right unless they're an expert of course so that is the idea how can height and weight decide hunger so nutrition levels are very important while decide getting the height and weight right if you have good nutrition that would improve your height outcomes and your weight outcomes <clears throat> your, your, yeah of course it uh, is affected by the geological conditions as well but those geological conditions are the outcome because of the food that they are able to grow jahan food grow nahi ho para that is the place they have hunger in and us hunger ke wajah se the height and weight is decided so that is the idea all right cool i think those are all the questions we have before we go i'll just discuss a little about the uh, initiative that prepzone has and then lastly we'll just discuss that how can you use these pointers to your advantage during your gdp and vat all right
cool uh, so again here i just want to discuss about prep zone a little prep zone is the leading gdpi a platform that there is right again these are a few numbers from the last year wherein we had around 1700 converts right at least one b school was converted by 96% of the students right that is a very huge number when you think of the number of students that were under prep zone right around 200 to 225 students that they were under prep zone 96 percent of them at least had one v-school convert and 94 percent of them had a blackie convert right so if you have any of the calls that you consider is important right and even if you think that this year you couldn't get get those you know calls or you might not be able to get those calls but you want to understand the gdp prep so that you are very prepared right for any interviews that you have this year and maybe if you repeat next year, you wouldn't know where to start. Then I would highly suggest you to enroll for the program, right? A few other things. These are the offerings that PrepZone gives out, right? So one of the most extensive offerings that you will get for any mentorship platform, live recordings for all the sessions, right? Approaches to PI, GD, VAT, then all these different sessions, right? Like today we had that index keeper session. We have detailed session on all these things, finance, history, politics, statistics budget economics so you would be even given a course on micro and macro economics i don't know how many of you are from the commerce background but just say 11 12th we study in micro and macro economics right so that is something that is very prevalent in your interviews as well but ab yaad nahi hota. and you can't just go back to the books and read the whole book so prep zone will conduct sessions on that as well they will call a teacher they will conduct sessions so that it saves you time on that next we have current affairs discussion one of the prime you know attraction of prep zone then daily live discussion would be held on certain platforms on current affairs. So current affairs keeper discussion or a specific topic topic keeper discussion every day there will be. For example, if something is happening with foreign exchange, right, then there will be a whole discussion on that. And general discussion on foreign exchange as well. So it will give you a multifaceted idea on what the you know whole topic would be. Next, we have question banks for every stream mathematics, graduation specific streams, right? Interview trade terms, all these things. And lastly, the core advantage that is the mentorship. You will give it, you will be given a specific single mentor, right? Who will be on the basis of your profile and B school calls. So they would be matching your undergrads. They will be matching your graduation streams, your work experience, all these things. They will help you with everything. SOP forms, essays, answer reviews, even the basic HR questions that you have, right? Uh, tell me about yourself. Uh, why do you want to join the B school? All these questions, these would also be, you know, uh, vetted by the mentor. You will be discussing with your mentor that how should I write this? They will evaluate your profile, get on calls with you and understand ki what specific things can you write and what help them convert their B school. Then you would be given seven to eight PIs, right? You would be given VATs, all the other, you know, aspects of other B schools as well. So those are the ideas. Again, here are a few mentors that we have for the GDPI coaching. Right, of course, these are just a few images. We have a lot more mentors that there are, right? Total 80 plus mentors. We have all converted their dream schools. And again, this is the uh, just a poster, right? Nothing to brag about, just a poster to give you inspiration also that so many people can convert these calls, right? It's just about how you prepare for your GDPI. All right, so this is the last slide. Again, if you are interested in joining the prep zone course, or if you have any question, you can reach out to me on this number, right? You can just ping me, ki, uh, this is the question I have, ki, will it be valuable for me? This is my background. Do you think I should take this interview coaching? I'll be more than happy to tell you. Again, I won't be biased. I won't be pushing the course. If it's not for you, it's not for you, right? So I'll be very unbiased on that. And if you want to join also, you can just ping me. I will uh, will be able to provide you with a discount as well, right, on the joining. Next, the last important thing, how to use this information. So three points. First, in your VAT. So VAT, the topic will not always be on indexes, right? Both rare chats will be index on topic. Aega. But if the topic is on, say, hunger, if the topic is on social outcomes, if the topic is on, you know, industries. So in those places, adding these statistics or even adding these ideas would be helpful, right? Just giving out ideas on uh, what the indexes are, maybe what the... Um, how the India is performing in these indexes. Giving these ideas in your VAT also improves the writing portion of what you're giving out. All right. Second would be the group discussion. 
so gds ke andar bhi there be a lot of social discussions right in there when you in front of a panel quote these indexes it shows that you are intellectually capable of understanding how these indexes work and you are someone who is interested in reading about these things right because indexes ke bare mein na har jana prepare nahi karta so if someone knows about it it just sometimes show that maybe you were generally interested in that right so that is the benefit and thirdly personal interviews may hook questions whenever there is any discussion about any specific topic always try to bring in these indexes wherever you can right ek bar lana matlab it's not that har bar lana ek bar bhi le aoge it just shows your intellectual capabilities all right so that was all about the session again as my number if anyone wants to note down if you have any questions reach out to me if you want to get a discount reach out to me all right open to any questions on the chat for a while of course um matlab if you are interested in going towards consulting also um these things would be very important right having intellectual conversations being well versed with geopolitics well versed with world you know affairs that becomes very important because these are the interesting conversation points that everyone looks forward to all right thank you so much hi sakshi yeah so we'll be sharing the recording as well uh, i think you can i'll just ask shubham, shubham once and we'll try to share the ppt as well so you can go through all of them all right dhruv just ping me on my number i'll just put my number matlab yahan pe it would might be a little difficult to answer all this so this is my number if you want to ping yeah the video will be posted again shweta ping me let's discuss there really interested in consulting but not very great acads what should be done for the same again not to worry about these things right academics is not something that you need to worry about now if you are interested in consulting start preparing for it right shortlists generally are a black box so if you are able to you know just improve on your cv just present it in a nice way you will be able to you know uh, ace your consulting interviews as well Hi, yes. India's poor performance on in global hunger index can somewhat be attributed to this huge population. Definitely, that is a very strong point. Huge population is generally a very big cause for higher hunger. You can see that jo countries perform me better career like Bosnia, right? These are smaller countries, Belarus. But China is the second most populous country. Why do you think China has been able to perform well on this index? Here, I think <coughs> in the last few years, China is. significantly focused on its population right not only in improving its outcomes but also improving its skills right so if you would go back and read about what china has done for its citizens how it has improved their skills how it has increased the industry outcome you would be able to understand ki gdp hai kaise chal rahi china ki and that easily resolves their hunger right so if you are able to focus on your population right if you are able to give them better skills and outcomes that matlab that is the root of all the problems and that can improve all out of them so i would highly suggest read about china that what they are doing specifically right for their citizens because that's a very interesting case study that i have read uh, recently only cool all right i think that is yeah all the questions so we'll end the session here uh, thanks for attending all the best for your gdpi interviews uh hope to see a lot of you at the prep zone interview master classes all right thank you so much